You're watching the free pilot training channel, and this is Private Pilot Ground Lesson 22. And on today's episode, we're going to be discussing all the other airspace you need to know as a private pilot. But don't skip this lesson because this information is really popular with DPEs when they're giving their oral exam questions. A lot of times, if you know this information, they'll leave you alone on some of the other airspace questions. Speaking of that, I created a separate playlist specifically for all the airspace study material. I'll throw that here in case you want to start at the beginning and work your way to this lesson. When we talk about other airspace, there's a lot of different airspace that falls into this category. But for today, I want to focus on what you need to know as a private pilot. Don't be intimidated by all this stuff. It's really not that complicated, and I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to know. The first example of this airspace is the local airport advisory. This is an area where you can get weather advisory service from a flight service station on certain airports in Alaska. Because these areas are only found in Alaska, I'm not going to go into any more detail. But if you need more information, check out the AIM. Now let's talk about military training routes. This is some airspace you definitely want to be aware of. And that's because military aircraft can be maneuvering at high speeds along these routes. In fact, they're allowed to fly over 250 knots when they're using these routes. To find these, first look for these gray lines. Now notice that these routes are labeled with a VR or a IR, followed by a three or four digit number. VR stands for visual route. That means these routes could be occupied when there's VFR weather. Then if you see these IR routes, those are instrument routes and those can be operated in any weather. When you see these routes with a four digit number, that means they're operated at 1500 feet AGL and below. But if you see these routes labeled with three numbers like this one, that means they can be operated above or below 1500 feet AGL. If you need to find out if these military training routes are active, the best way to do this is to contact the nearest flight service station. In this case, it's Jonesboro Radio. And we can either call them on the phone or we can use this frequency right here while we're in flight. And just ignore this higher frequency right here, that's a military UHF frequency. And here's a little gee whiz information, there's actually one more. SR routes or slow routes are uncharted military training routes, and that's because they're typically operated below 250 knots. Next, we're going to talk about temporary flight restrictions or TFRs. These areas are exactly what they sound like. When these are active, pilots are not allowed to fly into these temporarily. Here's a few examples of the many reasons why you might see a TFR. These can exist to protect people or property in the air or on the ground, protect the president, vice president, or other public figures. And in some cases, these may prevent an unsafe congestion of sightseeing aircraft above an incident or event that may generate a high degree of public interest. For example, you might find one of these over the stadium of your favorite football team. And I guarantee you, you're not the only one who'd like to see him score that winning touchdown from the air. Okay, so now how do I know when these are active and where to find them? First, you can check the FAA's website specifically made for TFRs. Then you can either search for the center airspace you're going to be flying through, or you can click here on the TFR map. Then you can zoom in on any applicable TFRs and take a look down at the notes. You can also get these if you use flight planning aids like 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF, ForeFlight, and other flight planning software. Sometimes you'll find that TFRs reoccur regularly. You can find these by these magenta diamonds on the VFR sectional. Then, to find out if these are active, you can check the NOTAMs or the same places we just talked about. Now let's take a quick look at parachute jump areas. While it's pretty obvious what these areas are for, what may not be obvious is how to find these areas and whether or not they're active. And that's really important information to know because you don't want to fly through one of these areas when these people are jumping. The first place we can find this information is in the chart supplement. There's actually a section specifically for parachute jumping areas. The first thing you'll notice here is that they separate these by states. Then they give you an approximate location, a maximum drop altitude, and just some remarks on when they're going to be operating. When these areas are used fairly regularly, you'll sometimes see these on the VFR sectional. But parachute jump areas can still exist when they're not noted in the chart supplement or on the VFR sectional, and the best place to look for these is in the NOTAMs. Now let's take a look at published VFR routes. Here are a few examples of these, but basically these routes are designed so that VFR traffic can transition easily through complex airspace. VFR flyways are nothing more than recommended flight paths so that VFR pilots can avoid major controlled traffic flows. You'll find these depicted as the big blue markings on the back of the Class Bravo airspace terminal area charts. 
Now, while you don't need a specific clearance to fly on these routes, it is your responsibility to make sure you follow all the other rules before going into any other types of airspace. Some Class Bravo airspace have something called VFR corridors. These are essentially VFR tunnels that extend to the Class Bravo airspace. These dash magenta lines are an example of a VFR corridor going through San Diego's airspace. And you just want to make sure you read all these rules before you use one of these. As you can see, you don't need a clearance to go into this particular corridor, but it'd be really easy to bust the Class Bravo airspace, which could get you violated. Then we have Class Bravo airspace VFR transition routes. These are denoted by these double-headed magenta arrows. Basically, this is the preferred routing ATC wants you to take if you're going to be transitioning the Class Bravo airspace. The big thing for you to remember is that you're actually going into the Class Bravo airspace to travel on these routes. So remember, you must be cleared to enter. And now for one of the most common questions on the oral exam. What airspace is denoted by this gray ring surrounding this airport? If you said Terminal Radar Service Area or TERSA, you're absolutely correct. Most TERSAs surround medium-sized towered airfields with Class Delta airspace. And while you're not required to call approach and get radar services, it can be very beneficial because this airspace can sometimes get kind of busy. And now we have national security areas. You can identify these by these heavy dash magenta lines. As you can tell from this note, pilots are requested to avoid flight into these areas. So I guess you could say these are kind of voluntary, usually. Now, these could be activated by NOTAM and then they could become a prohibited area. So I guess the moral of the story is, check the NOTAMs if you think you might want to fly through one of these. Next, let's take a quick look at the Air Defense Identification Zone. This is airspace that the federal government has decided that in the interest of national security, they need to readily identify, locate, and control all aircraft coming in and out of this space. You can find this airspace in a few different areas, including 12 nautical miles off the coast of the United States and on the border of Mexico. If you're thinking you want to take a vacation down into Mexico, make sure you have a mode C transponder, a working two-way radio, and you'll have to file a flight plan. In addition to that, there are a couple more things you have to do in order to cross into the ADITs, so make sure you check out the AIM if you want to do that. Next, we have the Flight Restricted Zone. Now, I'm not going to get into a ton of detail on this one because if you want to fly within 60 nautical miles of Washington Airport, you have to do a special awareness training anyways. If you need to take that training, you can find it on the FAA Safety website. Now, once we get within 30 nautical miles, we have this castellated ring. Inside of here, we have what's called the Special Flight Rules Area. This airspace starts at the surface and goes up to, but does not include, 18,000 MSL. Now, if you think you want to go in here, in addition to that training I just mentioned, there's a couple things you'll need. First, you have to establish two-way radio communications. Now, if you're going into the Class Bravo airspace, you'll have to get that clearance separately. Then you'll need a mode C transponder with an assigned squawk code. Last but not least, you have to be on a special flight rules area or an IFR flight plan. As we get closer to the center of the special flight rules area, you'll notice another area with a 15 nautical mile radius. This is called the Flight Restricted Zone, or FRZ for short. If for some crazy reason you want to go inside the FRZ, there's a couple special TSA requirements you have to meet. First, you have to get a personal identification number or PIN, then you also have to have a background check. When it comes to the ADITs, the Special Flight Rules Area, and the FRZ, these are all locations where you don't want to fly into those without following the rules. If you do, you run the risk of being intercepted by military aircraft. In worst case scenario, they could potentially shoot you down. Because of this, you really want to know your stuff before going into one of these areas. Now if you ever see these areas with a blue border with the dots inside, these can be a couple different things. When they're on land, these can either be wildlife areas, wilderness areas, or national parks. And guess what? It says right beside them what they are. This one happens to be a wilderness area. For these areas, pilots are requested to operate above 2,000 feet AGL. Now, while it seems like these are voluntary, I recommend abiding by these altitudes. If you hit a bald eagle while buzzing the treetops in one of these areas, that one's going to be kind of hard to explain. That being said, if you ever run into these NOAA marine areas, you're required to operate above 2,000 feet AGL. And these are marked the same exact way. The last type of other airspace we'll talk about today are areas where there are tethered balloons. Check out this restricted area right here. As you can see from this note, we've got an unmarked balloon on a cable that extends up to 15,000 MSL. Now we could flip our sectional over to the back to get some more information, but this tells me everything I need to know right there. If your plane hits that cable, it could potentially rip it right in half. And most pilots have a little bit of trouble trying to fly two planes at one time. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Free Pilot Training Channel. If you did, please hit that like button for me before you check out what other great videos I have that can help you become a better pilot. And I'll see you in the next video.